that works, you'll still be able to ask a question of the author if you'd like. To do so, uh, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. The chat function also will be active. And in that column, you'll find a link for purchasing a copy of this evening's featured book, What Were We Thinking? by Carlos Lasada. Carlos has one of the dream jobs in journalism. He gets to read and review books as the nonfiction book critic of the Washington Post. Anyone who follows his pieces knows how insightful and articulate he is. The Pulitzer Committee, which awarded him the prize for criticism last year, cited him for, quote, trenchant and searching reviews and essays that joined warm emotion and careful analysis. Of course, not everything about Carlos's job has been a joy for him. Uh, he's been compelled, for instance, to read something like 150 books about Donald Trump and the Trump era. Uh, you could call this, as Joe Klein does in a New York Times review, quote, an act of transcendent masochism on Carlos's part. Still, all this reading of his has given rise to his superb new book, which grew out of the reviews and essays Carlos has done for the Post. Uh, the book isn't really just a rundown of the many volumes out there about Trump and, and Trump land. Uh, it's, it's much broader than that. Uh, exploring how we as a nation have grappled with the Trump phenomenon, how we've thought about it in real time. In that sense, Carlos offers a sort of national re-examination an encompassing critique of this period in America's intellectual life. A typical of Carlos, his book is sharp, uh, smart, and enlightening. Uh, so I encourage, encourage all of you to read it uh, and get it as a, as a holiday gift for friends and families as well. Uh, and speaking of, of another uh, talented journalist, Jeffrey Goldberg also is here uh, with us this evening to, to talk with Carlos. Jeffrey, of course, is one of the most influential journalists in, in Washington today. Uh, he's been with The Atlantic for over a dozen years, first as a correspondent and currently as editor-in-chief. Um, so, Carlos and Jeffrey, the screen is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Thanks, Brad, very much. Thanks to Politics and Prose. Uh, I hope all of you who are watching will go to Politics and Prose and buy this book and buy other books because uh, uh, those of you who live in the area uh, around politics and prose know that um, without it, Northwest uh, Washington, D.C. would be just a, an arid desert of anti-intellectualism. And we don't want that to happen. Um, and you could also buy it as they put in the chat um, right on their website. Um, so, Carlos, before we start, I just want to uh, announce a couple of ground rules. I'm going to be like Chris Wallace a little bit. Um, uh, I'll just yell. Yeah. First of all, first of all, first of all, I recognize that um, uh, this is the second most important debate taking place tonight. Um, I also recognize that it's not actually a debate. Carlos and I, by the way, are separated by plexiglass and about ten miles, also, just for our safety. Um, so uh, let me uh, let me start, Carlos, by by asking you uh, to riff off of the title. What were you thinking? Because you know, you know, there is a there's a common view, and it's under, understandable that this was an act of incredible masochism, transcendent masochism, which is you know, if you're going to be masochistic, you might as well be transcendent. Um, you got to go all the way. You got to no. I mean, transcendent masochism is a beautiful thing, I guess, if you're a transcendentalist. Um, the uh, but this is not necessarily a masochistic act for you. I mean, your job is to read books, and you simply by nature of the reality around us, was starting to read a lot of Trump books, I suppose. But how did this how, how did this go from, I'm reviewing, it seems, a bunch of Trump books to um, an organized idea that you can get a book out of these books? Well, it started almost accidentally. Um, back in the summer of 2015, when Trump was suddenly uh, doing really well in the polls uh, for the GOP nomination, um, I approached my editor and just said, hey, what if I read a bunch of Trump's own books, uh, memoirs, self-help books, um, and just to see what I learn about the guy. Um, and I'd only recently started in the job as, as a book critic for The Post. And uh, my editor said, yeah, it's a good idea, but really do it quickly because, you know, who knows how long interest is going to last in, in this. Um, and uh, of course, interest has lasted for, for a long time. And it sort of went from there. Once I started reading books about Trump, then 
he starts winning primaries. So I started reading books about his supporters in 2016 and 17 was a big moment for uh, books about the white working class, right? Then when he wins, suddenly there's resistance books. So I start reading those, right? And then there's fights with about the future of conservatism, started reading those. And pretty soon I realized this was my beat. Uh, this was what I was going to do as a, as a book critic for the post. Um, and I would say that in 2018, 2019, I started wondering if there was something bigger to say about all these books collectively. Um, and I started working on an essay that I thought would run in the Outlook section of the Washington Post, which is where most of my reviews are published. And I came across two problems quickly. I, I wrote a few thousand words, but I, I realized first there was a lot more to say uh, that wouldn't fit in sort of one single piece. And second, um, there are a lot of books I still needed to read books that I had missed over the course of the, of the prior three years and books that I knew were coming. And so um, given those two imperatives to write longer and to read more um, is where this, this book came from. Uh, so in, instead of writing that, that sort of one, one piece for, for Outlook in the Washington Post, I, I wrote, uh, what were we thinking? Right. Um, how'd you come up with the title? You know, the one way, thing I, I, I want to tell the audience that this is a little bit of a trick question because in the interest of full disclosure, Carlos and I are friends and he asked me for some title suggestions and I gave him some bad ones. And then he went with this one, which is much better. But but tell tell us tell us the thinking behind the title. Yeah, I, I can't even remember those titles you gave me, Jeff. I mean, that must be how how bad they were. I um, think it was the it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Something <laughs> like that. Yeah. So I had all these lousy titles, not just um <laughs> Jeff Goldberg inspired, but but inspired by by my own my own thinking, um, and I didn't realize the title was this sort of negotiation, you know, conversation with your editor and your publisher, and and uh, this is this is the first time I've I've written a book, um, and so I I was sort of desperate, and I just started reaching out to uh, friends and colleagues and editors. And you know, saying here's basically the idea for this book, but I'm not sure what to call it. Here are my, here are my um, possible titles. Um, I thought of playing off the famous uh, Alan Bloom, the closing of the American mind, with something like the posing of the American mind, which is just terrible. Um, it's a so, my half. Yeah, exactly. And the, and so uh, actually, it was my Washington Post colleague Dana Milbank, who. Um, is both smart and and funny and has written many books. Um, who suggested what were they thinking? Um, but I thought that I wanted to be more all inclusive with the responsibility here, so it became what were we thinking? Mm -hmm. And once I did that, I once I, I had that, it sort of seemed like the the um, the right title, like the only possible title for the book, because it has this, there's no question mark on it. It's not like, what were we thinking, right? It's, it's trying to get a, a sense of that exasperation, but also be straight. Like this book is about what we were thinking during this period through the prism of all the books written about Trump. Right. Um, before we talk about what we were thinking, and what you learn from these books and talking about the books themselves. I wanna talk a little bit about your life as a reviewer. Uh, <clears throat> you're a well-known figure in Washington, especially, but all over the place. You're a Pulitzer winner. Um, can you describe for us the, the methods that you use uh, organizationally, intellectually, to keep everything straight in your head? I mean, this is, I mean, it's a very, very interesting subject to me, how, how you manage to, to, to keep 150 books, which is the, 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 the foundation of this project, uh, uh, organized in your mind so that you can make the connections you need to make. How do you read them? How do you take notes? Do you go back and forth between books? Do you read them one at a time? Did you read all of these twice? I'm just fascinated to know how you actually did the reporting of this. Mm -hmm. One sort of horrible thing about uh, my fit for this job is that I'm a very slow reader. Um, you that know, seems I, plausible, by the way. That just seems implausible. Huh? 
I know, but I, you know, it, I just feel, or at least I can get through a book quickly, but I think to really absorb it, I need more time. And what I try to do for books that I'm, uh, whether I'm reviewing them for the post or whether I'm, I'm writing about them in, in this book, um, I, I take three passes through each book. So the first time I read a book just straight through and I take a ton of notes and I, um, you know, I get lost in footnotes and endnotes, and and you know that's the longest read. Are you sitting at a desk? Are you lying in your hammock? Are you? How are you taking um, notes? It is it is weather dependent. I am I am. Um, if it's nice out, I'm I'm lying in a hammock um, between these two trees in our front yard, um, and it's you know it's it's tough work, but but someone's got to do it, um, and it's just the book and a pen. Um, I, I never read on on a device. I never read, you know, on on a tablet. It's it's always a uh, whether an advanced galley or a, or a hard copy of of a book, and so I take a ton of notes. Um, sometimes you know post its like just little um, messages to myself throughout about what I find interesting. You know, quotes, passages. That one takes the longest. Um, then I do it again, but with a highlighter, and I go through focusing mainly on the things that I was struck by the first time um, and and rereading some of those portions and kind of culling almost a, a, a subsection of, mm -hmm. of the first pass. And then um, I take that and read it a third time, this time with a file open on my computer. Um, and I just start dumping, you know, sort of an, another culling of, of ideas um, and quotes and questions that I have um, into that file. And so at the end of that process, um, which takes forever, um, I have sort of read the book three times and I have maybe four to 5,000 words of notes um, that become the raw material for the review. And so then I set the book aside completely and I just have this, and this is what I start trying to mold into a review. Um, I kind of stare at it and I reread it, you know, over and over again, and then sort of, you know, take notes on my notes. And finally, I figure out a lead and I figure out kind of where I want to get into this and then the key points that I want to make. So I think authors can maybe take issue with what I conclude about a book, but I, I hope no one can think that I haven't engaged with it seriously. Do you, have more, that's, yeah. Do you have more sympathy for authors now that you've written your first book? <laughs> first implies that there will be others. Um, that's that's uh, that's very ambitious. Um, uh, I I think so. I was I was wondering if this experience would leave me, um, you know, would would ruin me for 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 book criticism, um, because I realized how much work and effort goes into writing what is. A relatively short book. It's like 260 pages, um, and I also think it's probably healthy for me to go through the process of of getting reviews about my own book, of of, of feeling the heat of of criticism, um, you know, the the sting of a of a negative review. Um, though, of course, you know, there will be none because they'll they'll all be so glowing. Right. That's that's a little bit of your transcendent masochism right there. Right. But I think so. I think it's actually healthy. I mean, they say that that you know all journalists should be written about at some point and see what it feels like to, when people get something wrong or something's oversimplified. Um, I think it probably. I, I hope it'll help me as a as a critic to to go through this experience. Um, talk a little bit more about what makes a Trump book a Trump book. Uh, in other words, how did you? How did you decide what goes in the tent and what's outside the tent? And while I'm throwing questions, um, uh, throwing questions at you, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about some books that maybe didn't make it that maybe you think should have made it? Uh, um, so first, what what belongs um, in the sort of canon of of Trump books? Right, there's very there's the obvious ones that are the the insider tell-alls the the deep reported dives into the administration, um, the books about Trump himself, um, 
you know, and, and those are ones that tend to get a lot of attention and news. And I read as many of those as, as I can, but I think of this almost as, as concentric circles. So beyond those, you have then books that grapple with a big policy debate or cultural debate of the Trump era. So um, books about immigration during this period, books about, about identity, uh, books about the white working class, um, books about resistance or about conservatism. Um, those have Trump lurking in the background, um, but are not sort of dead on right about him all the time. But I also think of those as, as Trump books. And then uh, sort of the, the outer circle, which is often the most interesting, is the books that are not really about Trump very much at all, but that shed light on the forces and the ideas that are shaping this time. I think of Erica Lee's book, uh, America for Americans, which is a history of xenophobia in the United States that shows how uh, America's immigrant tradition has gone hand in hand with the rejection of, of outsiders. Um, I think of Timothy Snyder's On Tyranny, right, which was certainly inspired by Trump's election, but that takes a historical look at the, the, the warning signs of incipient authoritarianism um, and, and how, to, how to be on the lookout for those. Um, and then there's you know, the ones that aren't really, well, some of them are, but there, there are books that are really not about Trump at all, but just in a certain moment become Trump books in mm -hmm. my mind. So uh, Hillbilly Elegy is not about Donald Trump. That's J.D. Vance's memoir of growing up in Kentucky and Ohio. Um, it, because of the 2016 race, it became a Trump book. It became a book that a lot of people used to understand to, or to think they were understanding uh, Trump's supporters. A book like um, uh, White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, which I've written about in the post and I, I had some, 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 some concerns about. One of your um, least favorite books in this in this whole book, I think. Yes, yes. Although that's there's there's stiff competition, but you know that's a book that became um, became a Trump book, right? Because of the debates over uh, race and white supremacy and 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 whiteness as a as a concept. Even a novel, um, Ben Lerner's novel, The Topeka School, I think, is kind of a Trump book because it's about the evolution of debating tactics um, of high school debate you know competitions that really foreshadowed a lot of the um, the kind of rapid fire word salad um, uh, kind of mode of discourse that you see in some precincts precincts of of the right um, so almost any book depending on on the moment um, can can become a, a trump book Talk about um, some categories. I mean, let's go deeper into the categories. Um, the hardest question to ask you, I think, is, is what did you learn from reading these books that you couldn't have learned ambiently from reading your own newspaper, from reading magazines, watching television? Do you feel like you have a deeper understanding of Trump and Trumpism? Um, and if so, which books gave you that deepest understanding? I wouldn't say that this was the only way to acquire some sense of this moment that this was the or or the best way or that this gives me the the, the deepest insight it was it was my way it was it was the way that I was engaged in this moment um, James Paniwazik is a television critic at the New York Times and uh, he wrote a book about about Trump and television and understanding Trump through that medium um, and you know that that can be a very legitimate exercise as well, um, but I think that we have, and we, I mean, uh, this is a country that has always defined itself in writing from the very beginning, um, and I think that there are moments in American cultural life uh, when we feel like we're having this, these 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 moments of like what Sam Huntington calls creedal passion, right? These, these debates over, over first principles. And, and you often see books playing a significant role um, in, those, uh, in those periods. I mean, from, from common sense 
on forward, right? From like, you know, the, the, the pamphlets of, of the very beginning. Um, so I think that, that books have allowed me to gain um, a, a kind of understanding that I try to reflect in, in what were we thinking. Right. Um, tell us something that you learned about Trump that you wouldn't have learned otherwise from all this reading. Yeah. Well, the thing about Trump in particular, right? Like there's not a lot of, I mean, for all this dishonesty, there's not a lot of artifice to Donald Trump, like to, to quote the immortal, uh, you know, um, football coach, Denny Green, like, you know, to paraphrase him, Trump is who we thought he was, right? Trump, Trump is exactly as advertised. If you had gone back and read his own books, uh, the Art of the Deal, Surviving at the Top, Art of the Comeback, all the memoirs, all the all the self-help books, um, you see it all there. The Trump era would not have been surprising at all. Um, the the narcissism, the the lying, the the kind of vengefulness, the the constant quest for the the approval of the press, you know, even even coupled with mistrust of it, it was all there. So I think Trump is not um all that complicated and what what i sort of get through these books is that this whole notion of um of trump as this um you know strategic master of misdirection that he you know gets rid of one scandal by by launching another is sort of nonsense um uh, you know he makes decisions impulsively but very predictably with his own interests in, in mind, uh, whether it's, you know, even things you would think would be matters of high principle, like what kind of person you appoint to the court, um, it just becomes a matter of, of self-interest. And I mean, I always laugh a little when I, when I see some of the resistance writers, you know, do this, like, you know, not my president stuff. Um, you know, Trump, Trump's the one who made that choice. Like he, you know, from the very beginning, he was not going to be your president. He was going to sort of govern for himself and for, for his base. And so, a book like Unmaking the Presidency by Susan Hennessy and Ben Wittes um, is helpful here because it shows you, it, it gives you an understanding of what, uh, of where these norms that people are so concerned about that, that Trump is breaking, sort of how they built up around the presidency and, and what it might mean to, to lose them. And so in, in some ways, Trump himself is one of the least interesting characters in, in this story. Who is the most interesting character? <laughs> Apart from Ed um, Harry. I'm sorry? Maybe it's Ed no, Harry. Ed Harry, um, yes. Tell, tell the Ed Harry story because it's so illustrative of, of, of journalism and narrative today. So this is how, this is actually how I, how I kick off the, the book. Um, I read several books, maybe, maybe a dozen books about, about the white working class in, in, in America and I came across this character, right? Because a lot of journalists basically descend, you know, into into Trump country, quote unquote, right? Because that's what you call, you know, big chunks of the country when the only relevance is electoral, right? It's Trump country. Um, and uh, there's a book called The Great Revolt by Selena Zito um, and Brad Todd. And they're hanging out in Pennsylvania and they profile this Trump voter. Uh, named Ed Harry, who used to be a Democrat, longtime Democrat, labor organizer, delegate to the um, 92 convention that nominated Bill Clinton. Um, and he switched to supporting uh, Donald Trump and became a Republican. And in that book, The Great Revolt, they explained his motivations. And he's this kind of economic populist, uh, distrustful of political dynasties like the Clintons and the Bushes now. And he, uh, he feels the Democratic Party has forgotten working people, right? So that's why he moved to Donald Trump. So maybe five months later, and you know, a, do a dozen or so or more books in between, um, I'm reading another book called The Forgotten, also about the white working class um, by Ben Bradley Jr., um, long time of the Boston Globe. And suddenly I come across this character and I'm reading about him and he's this, you know, former labor organizer who's a delegate to Bill Clinton's not, you know, convention. And I just think, wait, I, I know this guy. Why do I know this guy? Um, 
And then it hit me. It was the same guy that had been profiled in this other book. And at first I just thought like, oh my gosh, that just tells you um, something about how formulaic this genre has become that you know, the same person even is, is being profiled in, in multiple books. But then I realized that his motives in the second book were completely different. In the second book, he's a 9-11 truther. He is a total culture warrior. You know, he's worried that George Soros is secretly funding Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and he seemed like a different guy, but of course he's not a different guy, right? And I'm not ascribing bad faith to these writers. I think that in many ways, they probably saw what they expected to see or wanted to see. And they portray this one person in ways that fit their larger arguments for why Trump was appealing. And um, for me, that was an extraordinary lesson of, of, uh, of this exercise. And one you only get because you read a lot of these books, right? Okay. And so to me, right. that was, that was the, the advantage. I, I don't know that anyone else necessarily read those two and put those things together. Uh, but it, it gives you pause because you see how um, well-intentioned, experienced journalists um, you know, fall into certain potentially preconceived narratives. I've not tried to figure out the truth of Ed Harry. I just, you know, I haven't gone looking for him to find out what he's really like. And I'm sure that I would, I would see in him what I want to see as well. No, clearly that's your next book, um, the, the biography of Ed Harry. But did this make you feel, coming out of this experience, did this make you feel um, less trusting of narrative or anecdotal journalism? I see a lot of hard work going into this kind of journalism. And I don't intend with an example like this to to minimize it, but it's it's what I tell my my journalism students. I I, I teach a, a college class, and you know you you have to just always be asking yourself whose views are being represented, whose views are not, um, you know uh, whose whose perspectives are most alive in any piece of of writing, whether it's it's a newspaper story or or a book, uh, and I end up getting. It's almost like the, the wisdom of crowds argument. I, I feel like I have more confidence in my understanding of a subject, the more I absorb and the, 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 the more I get different perspectives uh, into it rather than sort of, if I had read just one of those books, um, I think my, my understanding would be, would be limited. I mean, even, even memoirs, right? I mean, there's Hillbilly Elegy, which comes from a, a conservative point of view there's a memoir like Sarah Marsh's Heartland, which is, I mean, it's not Ohio and Kentucky, it's, it's, it's Kansas, um, but it's also growing up in, in poverty in the white working class in America. And it comes from uh, much more on the, on the left. And I, I think I'm a better, um, I, I, I gain better insight for having read both of them. Right. Um I want to, this is the closest I'm going to get to a gotcha question, but I want to talk about the books written by your Washington Post colleagues mm -hmm. for a minute. Um, the two biggest that I can think of and that you, you write about, well, one you don't write about because it's very, very new. Um, obviously, that's Rage by Bob Woodward. Um, and then there's A Very Stable Genius uh, by Carol Lanning and Phil Rucker. Um, and I guess if we, there's a third book, which would be Fear, Woodward's earlier book, which you mm -hmm. deal with. Talk, talk about... Um, Talk, talk about those books in the context of what you call the Chaos Chronicles. Right. Um, describe the phenomenon of Chaos Chronicles and, and, and then talk about mm -hmm. the utility of, and I'll give you an out here, talk about the utility of that kind of book, that fly on the wall, this is what happened in the tank in the Pentagon mm -hmm. kind of book. Uh, what I call, there's, there's a chapter in, in my book that is called the, the Chaos Chronicles and I, I think those began with Michael Wolff. Um, Michael Wolff wrote Fire and Fury, which became uh, this best-selling sensation early in 2018, that it covered maybe the first nine or 10 months of the Trump presidency. And it had so many just crazy, you know, oh my God, can you believe he said that moments um, that 
it sort of became not just a template for, um, you know, other, you know, professional journalists writing about the, the Trump era, but also about, it, it became the way that, that readers um, and consumers started to just understand these books. Like let's, what are the five craziest moments in X right. book, right? And that's interesting, it's, it can be fun, um, but it often you know, misses a lot of the work that these reporters are doing. So for instance, uh, let's take Rage, which, um, and I mean, I should, I should mention, I, you know, when I write for the Washington Post, I, I cannot review books by my colleagues because of the inherent conflict of interest. Um, um, but I do write about some of these books in, in my own book. And for instance, in, in Rage, the, the whole conversation around that book was dominated by the, what was it, 17 or 18 interviews that right. uh, Bob Woodward and Donald Trump had. Um, and some of the just, you know, sort of bizarre stuff that, that Trump was saying, and then like, oh, when did he know that COVID was so serious? Or, you know, what did he do? And, and really that's, and there's, there's good stuff there, but that's really only about half of the book. Right. And the other half of the book, I found, um, uh, frankly, just purely as a as a reader, I I found it a lot more compelling, and that is looking at the the first couple of years of the Trump presidency largely through the eyes of top national security officials like Jim Mattis, who was the Defense Secretary, like Dan Coats, who was the Director of National Intelligence, um, and you see, for instance, how how deeply concerned they are at the prospect of uh, like a nuclear conflict with North Korea, right? You have scenes of Jim Mattis heading over to National Cathedral to, to pray and kind of get his head straight um, so he could, he could be ready uh, for that moment. Um, and, and I think that, you know, without the sort of explosiveness and like, oh my God, uh, moments in the interviews, um, people would have paid more attention to to those kinds of conversations. In a very stable genius, um, you know, which was deeply reported as well. Um, you know, some of the things that I found most arresting in that book, most interesting, um, just um, received less attention in the in in the huge public conversation surrounding the book. Uh, for instance, that's where I first learned that. Um, Bob Mueller's team, the, the, the special counsel, uh, had just passed up the opportunity to weigh in on how Attorney General Barr was going to characterize the Mueller report, right? right? Which was huge, right? That was a that was um, you know, in hindsight, it feels like a like a stunning error to make. And that's where I first began to see um that kind of information, it, it wasn't even, but it, but it just didn't get a lot of attention in the aftermath of, of that book compared to some of the anecdotes, like, you know, when Trump had to read the constitution out loud, he, he couldn't, I mean, you know, like things like that, that, that are in the book and are memorable, but, um, but I found to be not as important as some of these, these other details. And I think that's what happens when sort of the chaos and mayhem of the Trump White House becomes this dominant feature of, of our reporting, of our conversation, and just of our, of our fixation. Um, and so that's how I think of the, of the Chaos Chronicles as, as sometimes a, a missed opportunity, um, not, just in, not just in some of the books themselves, but in, in what we, what we glom onto when we're looking at, at Donald Trump, because it seems like the chaos is, is all there is. Right, right. Um, before I get to a couple of more, one very, very large question and a couple of lightning round questions, I just want to uh, ask people if they have questions, put them in the Q&A and I'll, I'll, we'll get to them shortly. But for the lightning round, let's assume that everybody on this uh, broadcast will read your book. Um, they'll be delighted by the book, but they're, they're not going to learn everything there is to know inside the 150 books um, that you talk about here. If you had to recommend five, I'm also assuming that not everybody 
has a job in which they're allowed to be in their hammock and read 150 books about Trump. Um, it's a rather specialized job category. Um, <laughs> if you if you can name five books that are worth the, the worth reading that will explain some crucial aspect of America as it is today, or crucial aspect of how this all happened, hit us. Yeah. Um, now, I'll preface it by saying that that really depends on on what you want out of the reading experience. You know what what your expertise is, what your what your questions are, um, and so it's it's hard to say. But well, let's just go. Let's just I'll go, go ahead. Deepest understanding of. Yeah. What were we thinking? Yeah. So I'll, at, at the end of the book, I have a, an epilogue where I list a dozen books that I feel were most helpful to me personally um, and uh, during this time. So for instance, uh, Carol Anderson is a professor at Emory University historian and she wrote a book called One Person, No Vote about the history of voter suppression in the United States. Um, that to me feels like an essential book for this moment and gets you um, beyond like, oh, look what they're doing in this state or that state to show you the sort of the long trajectory uh, that, that voter suppression has in this country. Um, a book I mentioned already, Erica Lee's book, America for Americans, um, is, is a terrific look at how, uh, how xenophobia is um, as much a part of the American experience as um, you know, a, a nation of immigrants and 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 the you know Statue of Liberty kind of vibe that we get when we talk about immigrants in America. Um, most people know Michael Lewis from books like The Big Short or The Blind Side or Liar's Poker um, or Moneyball, um, but he wrote a book uh, called The Fifth Risk that um, looks at the essential work that is being done by unknown, uh, you know, to completely not famous bureaucrats in the Department of Energy and Commerce and Agriculture. Um, and in a moment when there's, you know, talk about the deep state and, and uh, this kind of backlash against, against the federal workforce coming, coming from the White House, I feel like this book is almost countercultural. Uh, it's, um, and, and yet, I mean, for my, I'm sure it sold really well, but, but for a Michael Lewis book, it seemed to kind of come and go compared to some of the others. Yet I, I see it as one of the most vital books of, of the Trump era. Um, there's a book called uh, We're Still Here by a sociologist named Jennifer Silva. Um, that is a book, it's is one of these white working class books, um, but yet takes a completely different prism. Um, first, it has the temerity to point out that the heartland is not in fact entirely white. Uh, and and treats non-white um, you know citizens of Pennsylvania with the same um, respect and attention that 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 Ed Harry, who was from Pennsylvania, merited. Um, but also showed to me that this question we've been having over and over um, about the white working class, like are they motivated by e economic struggles or cultural prejudice, um, is really sort of a, a false choice that these things can be inextricable um, and that more than being worried about whether, whether uh, these hardships or prejudices are moving them to one candidate or another, um, what she's worried about is that it is destroying their trust that anyone in the political system listens to them at all. Uh, she was, reporting and researching this book during the 2016 campaign and during um, during the election. And she writes about how she showed up one day to talk to some of the people that she was interviewing with her I voted sticker. And um, they laughed at her. They, they laughed at her for having the, um, for being so naive as to imagine that the system would be responsive to her desires. Right. Something that's so interesting about your list is that very few of them, or none of them, is on the list of the mega sellers that we think of as a Trump book. Um, Mary Trump, Michael Cohen, Bob Woodward, and so on. Uh, I, 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 I note that, and, and I wanted to ask you if there's one of those books uh, yeah. that you would recommend, which one of those? And, and I know this, those are two different I, categories. Those are the, 
I, unreliable eyewitnesses sometimes, and those are the reporters who are gathering all the chaos right. in, in one neat package. But yeah. which one of those did you find most useful or illuminating? I think, again, part of it depends on sort of what you're most interested in. If you really want insight on Donald Trump himself, I think uh, two books I would point out. One I thought very well done. One, another one I, I, I didn't like very much, but but these are two books that really bring you up close to him. And that is Mary Trump's book. Um, this is Donald Trump's niece, who you know, who's also a clinical psychologist and who tells the story, the story of this family, uh, you know, from within and from a very unique vantage point. Um, and also Michael Cohen's book which is a book that I found incredibly distasteful because everything that happens in it is awful and no one is redeemable. And I just didn't like anybody in that book, least of all its narrator, Michael Cohen. And yet, and yet it tells you so much about just how Donald Trump operates day to day uh, from someone who was right up there, up close for 10 years. And there's one moment in that book that that sticks with me um and it's when cohen had just started working for trump as 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 his lawyer slash fixer and he they they're at trump tower and they you know take the elevator down and they're walking through the atrium and cohen sees and is just shocked by like people just mobbing trump coming up wanting photographs wanting autographs um just you know trying to get a glimpse of of the guy from the apprentice and and trump you know turns to cohen and and winks at him and uh and says and whispers this is what trump is all about <laughs> and he's right that is exactly what trump is all about right being completely at the center of the story right that's where he wants to be whether it's a good story whether it's a bad story it doesn't matter like this past week when we've been literally hanging on his every breath is exactly how he wants it. And this is what Trump is all about has become this metaphor for me in, in, in thinking about um, you know, our, our, our coverage of this period, our, our thinking about this period. You know, we, we make it all about this one man as if, as if it were in fact about him, as, it were, as, as if it were not about you know, all the forces that have been building for a long time that led to him being even you know, within a stone's throw of the presidency. Um, but I, I, would, I would say if you're really interested in, in getting a sense of him and his family and his thinking um, and just how he operates day to day, uh, Mary Trump's book and Michael Cohen's book would, would be helpful. Um, one lightning, one more lightning round question. Let's, let's assume that the Trump era is coming to an end, dangerous assumption, but let's assume for the moment. Um, the next wave of books are gonna be these uh, autopsies, these forensic studies, the, the first histories of um, what will be remembered at the, in the most benign way of, of, of describing it, a phantasmagoric episode and, and, and maybe something a lot worse. Um, who would you love to see write the first great history of the Trump era? Oh gosh, um, to write the history of the Trump. Well, I mean, there are some versions that are coming, right? There, there are already there are already books in the works that are going to attempt to to do that. Like, this, um, is, this is this is nerd fantasy camp, like right? You know, I would love like part of it is that there are going to be so many books on this that I would want rather than like there will be great histories of the Trump era and I'll read them and I'll review them and they'll be great but I think that in in some ways the this period has been so um or at least it feels like it's been so unusual and so intense that I think like maybe satire could be a great way to address it in some way. People often do like, you know, which deceased writer would you love to still be around today? You know, yeah. and it's like, oh, Hitchens or Twain or, you know, um, like in my in my nerd fantasy camp, um, Evelyn Waugh is writing uh, the story of the Trump era. You know, it's decline and fall, but you know, for instead of, you know, a little, 
a, 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 a school for elite, you know, an, an elite boarding school. It's 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 the White House, and uh, you know, Jared Kushner is the is the is the pampered child of the middle. Um, that's a book I want. For instance, speaking of Kushner, his story um, in the White House, everything he's done, the sort of monumentally bad judgment that it. Whatever book I'm reading, whatever subject it is, immigration. COVID, you know, anything, you see Kushner's fingers all over it and you see like terrible decisions being made. Um, and that's a book that I want to see written, for instance. Um, I see one your... other book. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, a book that, um, and this is not just to suck up to the moderator, a book that I kept hoping would be written before I finished my book so I could include it would be a book by, um, by Adam Serwer at The Atlantic. I kept hoping for him to kind of put it all together. Um, all the sorts of ideas he's been grappling with over the last four years. Um, so that's that's a book that I, I I hope can can happen someday. I I do have that those kind of like fantasies. I wish I wish X person would write on Y subject. Right, right. Um, all good ideas. I see your Evelyn Wan. I'll raise you Graham Green. I think Graham Green would be very very interesting on this subject. Um, let me ask. Let me uh, raise a couple of uh, other books that people in the in the Q and A have raised. Um, Arlie Hochschild's The uh, uh, Strangers in Their Own Land. Have you read it? And this John Hibbing book, The Securitarian Personality. Either of those show up across your radar? Uh, I read the first one. I read Strangers in Their Own Land. And that is a book that received much acclaim. Uh, it was a finalist for the National Book Award. Um, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. And I spend um, quite a bit of time in my first chapter on the white working class uh, on that book. Um, I felt that this was um, a case of um, of an author who came to a story with a lot of preconceived ideas. I mean, she starts off telling readers that before she went to southwestern Louisiana uh, to you know for her for her reporting to talk to uh, Tea Party Republicans, she um, she read Atlas Shrugged because you know she figured they'd be into that, and and she was surprised to see that they were really nice people sometimes, you know. Um, and that was just a big turnoff from, from the very beginning. Also, she does something that a lot of these books do and that she creates these sort of prefab categories for understanding people, right? So it's like, you know, you have the, you know, I, I can't remember what, what, what the categories were, um, but the book I mentioned earlier, um, The Great Revolt by Selena Zito does the same thing, you know, um, and it just, sort of simplifies and flattens people a little bit was was my feeling with that book. But I was kind of alone on that. A lot of people gave it rave reviews and really, really liked it. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask this question from Emily Wilkes. I guess that's the way to pronounce her name. Uh, appreciate your comments about projecting assumptions onto white working class folks living in quote unquote Trump country. Going to this next election, what would be both a truthful and compassionate way to engage with Trump voters? Obviously that's an enormous sub theme right, in, in a lot of the literature, um, how do we talk, how to quote, we talk to them. Um, and, and, a, and a lot of journalism and a lot of commentary these days and, and for the last four years is, what, what's the magic, what are the magic words that get Trump voters to understand that he's a racist, a misogynist, or this or that, or the other thing? Did you see any clues in what in your reading? The first thing I would do is to stop calling them Trump voters, right? They are not solely defined by um, who they, you know, marked a ballot for in in the last election, nor uh, nor is anyone else defined um, solely by um, by who they vote for. I think I, yeah, yeah, I think that's where we've gotten that that's where we are right now. Where um, this dichotomy, you know, you're either like your 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 base or your resistance. You can't be anything else, and um, and I think that's a huge mistake. Um, and I think that trying to have a more encompassing view of, of individuals uh, would be would be a great place to start. Right. Um, here's a question from Neil, which is interesting. Could the two versions of Ed Harry be related to the timing of the books, allowing him to descend deeper into Trumpian views or were they pretty concurrent? Um, that's a really good point. Um, I don't I don't know because I don't. Um, I know the books themselves came out in the same year, and so I don't imagine that there was a vast um, uh, difference in in when they they spoke to him. 
Um, but I think I think it it, it could it, it could be simply that you know you have one person evolving in his thinking. Um, at the same time, what was notable for me is that the the arguments the authors presented for Trump's election and for Trump's appeal um, uh, kind of put Ed Harry right in the sweet spot, right in 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 how they saw it. So. Um, but that that certainly could be could be part of it. I mean, I think a lot of people have evolved over the last four years to have become radicalized in in different ways. Right. Um, I want to ask you a very large question, um, and it goes to what were we thinking? And I and I ask you this, hoping that you will will re refract this question through the prism of your own American story. You're a new ish American. Um, uh, and, and and you, uh, not supposing anything, but you have the ability, uh, and I think from watching you, the gift to understand America, both as an insider, Notre Dame graduate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I had to throw that in there or else you get very sad. Um, uh, but also an outsider, an immigrant, um, who fairly recently, if I'm not mistaken, um, became a naturalized citizen. It wasn't that long ago. Um, uh, in, in 2014. 2014. Um, so the question for you is, is you're watching and you're reading with a bunch of, with, with, through, through a lot of different um, uh, prisms. Uh, what, what is happening? How do you explain what has happened in this country in the last four years? How do you move, move so drastically from an Obama presidency to a Trump presidency. What, what are you learning about America? Good and bad. I'm going to assume there's some good somewhere as well. Um, and do you think any of these books that you've that you've dived into? Do you think they they, they fully grasp the enormity of what has happened in the last four years? That's a lot of stuff for you to chew on. Yeah. Um, let me let me pick off a few of those and and ignore the ones where, where I have no idea what the answer is. Right, I've already uh, forgotten them anyway, so it's okay. The, yeah, that's <laughs> that's ideal, I can just say anything. Yeah. The, I, I did become an American citizen uh, in, in late 2014. And so the first election in which I was eligible to vote was 2016. Um, and I, I came to this country as a child, uh, I, was, I was three, but then um, from, from Peru where I was born, but we um, we returned to Peru when I was about ten, and then I I, I uh, stayed there until I finished high school, and so I, I came back to the U.S. for for college. Um, being an immigrant in in America, I mean, you know, far be it for me to sort of speak for all immigrants, but being being an immigrant in America is this constant mix of you know hope and insecurity, right? Of 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 feeling. Um, uh, needed but also unwelcome um and even as you you know as your family or or you came here seeking something better you know part of you is always looking back with nostalgia you know you're always wondering what if right what if we had stayed you know how would things be different um and but it's also an act of faith and it's an act of faith in in america in 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 the principles of this country, in the American experience, in the it's faith that you'll be you can be part of it, um, and so I think that that faith automatically has to influence the way that I think about what's going on, the way I read these books, um, books that appeal to me um, in this in this in this uh, in my job as a book critic in in writing this book books that, that stay with me are ones that put all the fights we're having right now, um, you know, as just part of the full sweep of the American experience, right? It's, it's, these aren't anomalies. These are fixtures of, of, of who we are fighting over immigration, um, you know, race as a, as, as a central, central divide in, in American life. Um, you know, these are part of the American story. We can, we can fight over them now. We are fighting with that. We we need to fight over them now. Um, and 
knowing that they're ever present um, doesn't mean it's just throw up your hands and 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 say, oh well, this is who we are. Um, the the fight is also ever present, and this just is just our turn. Talk about books that that projected or built for you a road out of this morass, this mess. Um, did you read anything that left you feeling optimistic about where we are? Um, I think the optimistic, that's, that's, that, that's a big ask these days. Um, um, I think that some of the non, books- Non-despondent. Non- non-despondent. <laughs> non non-despondent is a new optimist, yeah. The, um, I think that a book, uh, it, it's tended to be books by historians, like the, the, the longer the view, um, the less insane and anomalous the current moment feels. Um, and so a book like These Truths by Jill Lepore that looks at the, those self-evident principles of the declaration um, and how we've, struggled to live up to them from, from the very beginning um, was, was helpful for me in that regard. Um, uh, John Meacham um, wrote a book called, um, what, what, it's right here, it's behind me, um, The Soul of America. They're all, all, they're all here, by the way, all the books that we're talking about are right, are right here behind us, um, that, that you know, intended to be comforting by telling us that we've been here in these battles before. Um, but even even that can can give its own sense of despondence. But I think just the for me what is what has been reassuring, um, even among you know the mayhem of the chaos chronicles and and all the rest is that these are fights that are eternal in the American story. Um, and so um, you know and as an immigrant coming here um, and signing up for it. Right, um, like actively becoming a citizen. I, I was I was a green card holder for for decades and never felt the need to go all the way to 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 become an American citizen, and um, and in the end, I ended up signing up for it just at a time of of you know intense and maximum uncertainty and despondence over over the American experiment, um, and um, it's discouraging, but also I'm kind of glad that I'm here for it and that I'm all in for it. I'm glad too. I mean, it's great to have, it's, it's great to have you do um, some hard work for us um, by reading these books <laughs> and, um, and only by reading so much will you actually develop a thesis uh, or theses of the various cases that need to be discussed. Um, so this was, this was just great. I really do, um, I really do recommend this book very strongly. It's um, it's not it's it's a it's a fairly thin volume. You can get through it quickly. Carlos did a lot of well, you. You said you took about five thousand words of notes on each book on average. Uh, yeah, give or take. I mean, I have. I'm very old school. I don't do uh, I don't do Google Docs or anything. It's like all like huge three ring binders. With um, my only my only point is that is that Carlos did the hard work of shrinking down millions of words so you could understand this era. Uh, I strongly suggest um, you you buy this and and read this and pay, and and be a excellent patron of politics and prose. And uh, I want to thank Carlos for doing this and congratulations on your forthcoming cover review in the New York Times Book Review and all of the acclaim you've gotten so far. It's really fantastic. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, Jeffrey, great moderating, and, and Carlos, what a what a meaningful, helpful, and, and important book. It's the, the, the book of books. Uh, the book of books. As it were. And, um, and, and one encouraging thing to come out of this evening's conversation is the, the disclosure that you're a slow reader. Uh, so if you can do, <laughs> if you can do the amazing job you do reviewing so many books, there's really a, no, no excuse for the rest of us. I was also thinking, Brad, one more thing, that he's, his hammock is in the front yard. So you can take tour buses around Washington and like point out the window and say, that's the Washington Post book critic at work. There he is. I mean, it's like watching a panda asleep, but you know, <laughs> it's Some, not, sometimes, that, sometimes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, that was another amazing revelation. To, the tour. Um, to everyone watching, a reminder that you can find a link to buy What Were We Thinking in the chat column. Uh, and there also are listed 
links to uh, some of the other books mentioned by Carlos this evening. Um, thanks to all for tuning in uh, from us here at Politics and Prose. Stay well and well read. <laughs>